Welcome to Heaven Awaits. My name is Lee, and I narrate the near-death experiences of those who have died and have seen the other side. If you enjoy these videos, please consider hitting the thumbs up, subscribe, and bell icons to be notified of new content. Doing so is free, and it does help the channel grow. Before we get into today's experience, I want to give another quick update on the book. Proofreading is going smoothly. I have found some issues that need to be corrected. I want this book to be the best that it can be. It is still looking like I will make my early July publication date, so that is exciting. To those of you wondering about the name of the book, it is titled Heaven Awaits, Unveiling the Mysteries and Transformative Power of Near-Death Experiences. Anyway, enough blabbering from me. Get comfortable, grab a cup of coffee or tea, and let's dive into today's experience. I had spent years battling more than one autoimmune disorder and had undergone a few surgeries related to my chronic illnesses. In addition to that, within the space of 13 months, I had undergone two heart surgeries and a fractured spine that needed to be fused. The fractured spine occurred while recovering from heart surgery while awaiting brain surgery to remove a tumor that was diagnosed the same day as the heart condition. I was losing my balance and peripheral vision as a result of the tumor and consequently fell down a half flight of stairs and broke my back. It was while in the hospital with a post-surgical spinal infection following the fusion that I began to leak cerebral fluid through my nose. The doctors told me that I could not wait to recover from my respective surgeries but would have to undergo brain surgery as soon as possible. I mention all this because I had suffered greatly and because of that and a poor quality of life. I told my husband that, under no circumstances did I ever want to be revived should I die. This had been long established, and I had a standing DNR. I even made my husband practice saying, No, I do not want my wife resuscitated. I was adamant. On the way to the emergency room I yelled, Call Jason, call Jason, I need to hear his voice, I am dying. Jason is my son. It was urgent that I needed to say goodbye to my son. Everything happened very rapidly upon my arrival at the hospital. I had vomited so much that I was dry heaving, but lacked the strength to bring my body into an erect position in order to vomit. Blood tests were run, and a diagnosis of post-surgical hyponatremia was made. I lapsed in and out of semi-consciousness. When the phlebotomist arrived to draw blood, my husband immediately recognized her as a phlebotomist we befriended during my frequent visits to the lab for regular blood draws. Her name is Shirley. My husband reported that she drew the blood and her face went pale. When he asked her what was wrong, Shirley said, I cannot tell you or I'll lose my job. My husband implored her and she showed him a vial that looked like it contained only water. It was clear and not red. There were no live red blood cells, a foreboding sign of things to come. I can't say how long it was until I absolutely knew I was within minutes of dying but there came a point where I was certain of it. If you can visualize a soap bubble blown and floating in the air until it pops, that's what it felt like to me. My cells felt like bubbles that were popping throughout my body. When the ultimate realization came to me that I had two, maybe three breaths left, I instantly became terrified of dying. I, like many people, had always flippantly said that I'm not afraid of dying. But here I sat, right on the cusp of my last breath, and I was afraid. I experienced the same kind of adrenaline rush one feels when they come within a breath of a life-threatening car accident. My heart was in my throat. I felt fear. Then came the shame I felt because I was going to die terrified and feeling ashamed of myself. The feeling was sad, ugly, and overwhelming. Meanwhile, breathing was getting harder and harder. I had not been given any hallucinatory drugs or painkillers. Then I had an experience at the apex of my fear and shame, in all my anxiety and fear. I suddenly felt a hand rest on top of my right shoulder. The hand gently gripped my shoulder and drew me backward toward itself. I was enfolded into the arms of this magnificent, loving presence. There was no tunnel or journey. My fear and dread were completely gone as if they had never occurred. I found myself instantly in this incredible sea of living light. It's so hard to describe accurately as I was a part of this sea. It was in me and through me. This space of light was alive and nurturing. With me was a divine presence that I immediately associated with Jesus. I can only relate this experience as being in the universal womb of love. 
It is a love that is nothing like what we humans call love here on Earth. I basked in this nurturing environment and received information via intuitive knowingness. I was told I would return because I still had work to do. With that, I was instantly back in the hospital room. My husband was sitting across from my hospital bed with his head down. I was positioned to his left and slightly above him. I saw my body in the bed. I also saw a nurse in the doorway. She raised her voice loudly as she addressed my husband. Mr. Winter, do you want us to enforce the DNR? Strangely, I recalled my having made him practice saying, no, let her go. I was right there whispering in his ear, say yes, say yes. Suddenly, he lifted his head and said, yes, do everything you can. As if I were drugged, everything faded to black. I would awake days later surprised that I had spent six days in the hospital. My husband said I had rambled for days as if I were in conversation with God. After my near-death experience, I had instances of intuitive knowingness with a certainty that was uncanny. I never attributed it to myself, but as a continuation of a two-way communication that started while outside my body. I can attest with absolute certainty that when the body vehicle is dropped, our consciousness does not blink, not even for a nanosecond. I hesitate to share this part, but because it did actually happen, and because I know that these experiences are part of the work I came back to do, I am compelled to share. There were more than a few instances that I still, to this day, find hard to digest with my human mind. A few of my post-NDE experiences came in the form of being the recipient of precise communications and information from souls who had transitioned and who sought to offer assurance to a loved one who were grieving. One experience happened with a perfect stranger at the shopping mall. I also experienced an instant and insatiable appetite for mathematics and physics. I consumed volumes of books. I understood and could elaborate upon the thesis offered. I read dozens of books on ancient India, the wisdom of the Vedas, Upanishads, and the Mahabharata. I experienced myself as being a part of a living field, the Akashic field, the Higgs field, the unified field, ether and etc. I further experienced everything as living sentience and being humans as holographic fractals of the Supreme Source. That is manifest in a form relative to our resonate frequency. There were also profound intrapersonal slash spiritual experiences with animal sentience that defied human logic or expectation. Had I not recorded them, they would be hard to believe. As my meditation practices matured, I came to the realization that, at least for me, the place I went to in my NDE was exactly the same place one visits during transcendental meditation. Thus, making meditation a valuable practice for my mental, physical, and spiritual health and for preparation for that journey that begins upon the death of the body. There is so much more, including another NDE, but this one is paramount and has had an everlasting effect on me. That does it for today's experience. As always, let me know what you all think in the comment section below. Until next time, stay safe and continue to be blessed. Thank you.